the Blend Options dialog is present in all Affinity apps and contains several very useful options for any workflow where you are blending layers together. I'll show you some examples of its use in Affinity Photo, but all of these techniques can be applied to designer and publisher as well. I have this composition here, and I'll show this fire circle layer that I want to composite over the top of the background image. Typically, we would use a blend mode, such as screen or linear light, to achieve this. I have the desired effect where the brighter pixels have been blended through, but there is still a very obvious seam around the edges of this image that I want to get rid of. Rather than manually masking the edge details, I can click on this cog icon next to the Blend Mode dropdown, which will open the Blend Options dialog. There are several options here of note, but for this example, we will focus on source layer ranges. This is a point graph, similar to the curves adjustment. The line from left to right covers the tonal range of our active layer, and there are two existing nodes or points on this graph. The left-hand node represents minimum intensity, and the right-hand node represents maximum intensity. If I click drag and bring this left-hand node all the way down to the bottom, this will gradually blend away the darker tones of the layer. We now have a linear ramp on this graph. Zooming into the top area here, I can start to bring this node back up, and you will see the edge of the composite image reappear. I can click drag to add another node to this graph and push it up in an effort to bring back more of the darker detail rather than blending it away. Linear transitions between tones can sometimes look quite sudden or harsh, so I can uncheck linear and the graph nodes will now behave in a smooth, nonlinear fashion. I can introduce additional nodes to further control the tones until I end up with a result that I am happy with. I'll briefly explain the blend gamma up here. I can zoom in quite far to see the composite layer in more detail. Now observe what happens when I decrease the gamma value all the way down to one. Detail around the blended areas becomes slightly brighter. One is linear gamma so no additional transform is being applied to the final blended pixel values. As I gradually increase the gamma value, these blended areas become darker again. The default value is set to 2.2, as it closely matches the power law sensitivity of human vision. There is, however, no right or wrong approach, so feel free to experiment and see which value works best. You will notice there is also a hard stop at 1.45 but we will explore that later. We have another graph called Underlying Composition Ranges. I'll demonstrate what this does with another example. This is a prime use case, blending text with a textural background. Sometimes blend modes will suffice. Overlay gets close to blending the text in nicely with the background texture, but we may wish for finer control over the blending. I'll open the Blend Options dialog again. Now I could try manipulating the right hand node on source layer ranges, but this will essentially have the same behavior as if I had just reduced the layer opacity. This graph is just controlling how the current layer blends tonally with the layers beneath it. Instead, I'll pull down the left hand node on the underlying composition ranges graph. The key difference here is that this graph is controlling how layers beneath blend through the current layer we are working on. I can create a couple of additional nodes to achieve a more complex blending than would have been possible with just changing the blend mode and opacity. It's also a good idea to toggle the linear checkbox and compare the result between linear and nonlinear behaviors to see which you prefer. Because these blending options are non-destructive, you can always come back to them and experiment with the node placement at any time. These two graphs share another similarity with the curves adjustment in that they have a channel drop-down option. So far I've been using master, which blends using grayscale intensity with a weighted sum of the RGB channels. We can, however, 
modify blend ranges for individual channel information, and I'll show you an example of this with another document. For this composition, I'll add a black and white adjustment layer, then I'll close the adjustment dialog and open the blend options dialog. I'll switch from master to red, then I'll click drag the right hand node on the underlying composition ranges graph all the way down. This blends through highlight and midtone detail from the red channel of the layer composition underneath the black and white adjustment. Across on the blue channel, I might then click drag the left hand node down. This is starting to remove too much of the black and white effect that I've added, so I'll click drag to create another node and push it up near the top here. I might even switch to the green channel and create a node, then place it somewhere in the middle here. I can move it around and instantly see the effect it has on the layer blending. Now I can hide the black and white adjustment and show it again to see the before and the after. So using blend ranges, I've managed to add a very subtle modification to the sky in the composition, reducing its color intensity and increasing the brightness of certain tones. You'll notice other options on the dialog, such as anti-aliasing and coverage map. I'll show you a good use case for these. With this composition, I have a text layer, and I'm just going to zoom right in here until we can see the individual pixels. Now I'll open the Blend Options dialog with the text layer selected, and I'll look at the anti-aliasing drop-down options. This defaults to Inherit, which means it will follow the Parent Layers option if the current layer is a child layer. This is more useful for vector work or pixel art, where you may wish to explicitly disable anti-aliasing for a grouped collection of polycurves or pixel layers. By default, however, Inherit will have the same effect as force on, so anti-aliasing is always used by default. If I choose force off, you will see the edges become jagged. Anti-aliasing is a method of reducing jagged edges. If I toggle it back on, you can see that the edge pixels become semi-transparent, which creates a softer transition between the foreground and background detail. In most scenarios, anti-aliasing is desirable and will increase the quality of composited layers. If I zoom out slightly, then disable the anti-aliasing, you can clearly see that the aliasing looks bad for text composition, so I'll leave it set to inherit, which will force anti-aliasing on. Revisiting the Blend Gamma slider, notice that the value for text layers is set to 1.45. This default is used because most fonts are designed for gamma incorrectness when text is rasterized. So actually, using completely linear gamma results in font edges looking slightly too thin, whereas a value of 2.2 makes them look too thick and dark. So 1.45 is regarded as a suitable middle ground between the two results. Coverage map lets us modify the anti-aliasing ramp and this controls the distribution of the anti-aliased pixels. For example, if I drag the left-hand node all the way to the top, the outer pixels become more solid until there are no longer any semi-transparent pixels. I can drag this back down, then click drag to create an additional node. This gives me much finer control over the anti-aliased pixels. There is also a reset button, which is useful for quickly returning to the default linear ramp. Finally, we have fill opacity, for which I will use another example to demonstrate. I have a group comprised of vector rectangle shapes here, and I'll set its blend mode to hard mix. Now the result looks quite unpleasant, and blending using the layer opacity option doesn't improve the result. With certain blend modes, however, the actual fill opacity can be modified instead, which increases the range of blending results that can be achieved. On the Blend Options dialog here, watch what happens 
when I reduce the fill opacity. The result becomes much more palatable without losing the gritty look that we might use the hard mix blend mode for. You will find this distinct behavior with other blend modes, such as difference. Notice how this blending appears with a 50% fill opacity compared to 50% layer opacity. Changing the layer opacity creates a faded off color look, whereas reducing the fill opacity instead modifies the intensity of the colors. The blend modes you can try this technique on are Color Burn, Linear Burn, Color Dodge, Add, Vivid Light, Linear Light, and of course, Hard Mix and Difference, which we have just looked at. And there we go. That was a detailed look at the Blend Options dialog. Don't forget that you can perform all of these techniques in Designer and Publisher as well, so you can achieve some very advanced detailed blending, regardless of which discipline or area you are working in. I hope you found this video useful, and thank you for watching.